Back in 1996 in Japan, the original Pokemon titles were released on the Game Boy to great fanfare. They would later go on to conquer the world and become one of the biggest crazes for my generation. For anyone who wasn't around at the time, it was absolutely crazy, especially with the advent of the card game that led to many schoolyard fights. And as with any success, a handful of pretenders would rise to get a piece of the monster collecting trend. With every big fish, there's a leech on the belly. The most well known of these being Digimon and Monster Rancher, with a bunch of smaller ripoffs fading into obscurity. But if you want to get technical about it, Digimon didn't really start off life as a Pokemon clone. It was a Tamagotchi ripoff. Well, it was made by the same company Bandai, so it's not really a ripoff, it was intended as a boy focused version of Tamagotchis. But obviously, if your franchise has monsters in it and it's the late 90s, you're of course going to be compared to Pokemon. Even if most of the media and the way it works isn't really similar at all, but they definitely benefited from this trend. Because there was always that one kid at school who said he liked Digimon more than Pokemon because they were cool and different. Went to a steampunk convention, flew there in a steam-powered gyrocopter. I wasn't one of these kids, but I definitely liked Digimon, probably nearly on par with Pokemon. And most of this love came from the fact that the anime was absolutely amazing and leagues above the Pokemon anime. But that love also came from the first Digimon game, which to this day is one of my favourite games of all time, which spawned a series of games that in some form or another still goes to this very day. For better or worse, this series definitely has a very patchy history and I only really deeply played the first game. So that's kind of what this video is, an excuse for me to play through the whole series and see what I think. And I mean every game that is counted as a main series game because I went deep in this video and it's going to be a long one. I did however leave out the DS games because they are technically not Digimon World games, they are technically Digimon Story games, so they will be in a separate video at some point. Anyway, let's get into this mammoth video. Digimon World starts with one of those fancy FMV cutscenes that every game on the PS1 was using at the time, and it hasn't aged too well. Oh my god! What's wrong with your face? These are demons. But it does show off the real digital pets that they were based off, which is kind of cool, and this battle between Metal Mamemon and Metal Greymon is still awesome. When we start the game proper, we are confronted by Gigimon, the boss of File City, who asks us a few questions. And based on our answers to these questions, the game will decide which starter we get out of Agamon and Gabamon. I of course gave all the sad boy emo answers so I could get Gabamon because I'm such an edgy boy. My name's Evan and I'm a teen werewolf. Then you can name your Digimon which I gave the name of Lemmy after the king of rock and roll himself. There's then another FMV cutscene where our freak face character gets home from school to find his mum has abandoned him again. Then we get sucked into our Digimon keychain thing and end up in the magical world of Digimon. As you do. We awaken to find a bunch of Digimon surrounding us and our main character doesn't seem to be the least bit concerned about all the literal flesh demons surrounding us. Actually, you know what, I wouldn't be that scared of anything either if I had a face like that. We enter Digimon's hut and he tells us all the Digimon on File Island have been leaving the city and losing their heart. And it's going to be our job to bring all the Digimon back and raise up our partner Lemmy. Then I'm like, alright. And that is literally it in terms of the story, you're just now let loose to roam the world freely however you choose. Which is one of the things I love about this game the most, it just gets out of your way and lets you enjoy the ride. Sure, this was by no means my first open world game, but it was the first one I played where it actually felt like an adventure. The design of the world and the music just sucked me in, it has a sort of liminal spaces feel to it. With all of these pre-rendered backgrounds and the really cool looking sprites, it just gives this game a sort of cosy, otherworldly feel. This game is just like comfort food to me, with it being such a relaxing game to play most of the time with barely any music. Most of the time when you're adventuring about, you'll just be hearing ambient noises, which I absolutely love. But when the music does turn up, it's absolutely banging, with the day and night town themes being phenomenal. Of course, none of this would mean anything if the core gameplay loop wasn't good, and it is. If not, a little bit weird. And if you know me even a little bit, you know I like things that are weird more than anything, and this game definitely fits the bill. This game is unlike any other monster battling game, with it resembling the Tamagotchi-like devices it was based on. They've basically taken the mechanics of that and plonked it into an open world game, which works so well and makes this game very unique. You'll have to feed your Digimon when they're hungry and take them to the toilet when they need to poo. Yes, I'm being dead serious. How does this giant snowman even poo? Is that how chocolate ice cream is made? I I'm sorry, did you want some ice cream? Yes. I'd love some chocolate ass cream. And the best part of all of this is if you don't make it to the toilet in time, they will crap on the floor, leaving a constant reminder of your failures as a parent. You can tell when they want to poop or eat by the bubbles that pop up over their head, and most of the game is about micromanaging this. Some people might get annoyed by this, but the whole point of the game is for it to be Monster Dad Simulator, and I'm all about it. Every time you need to go to town and do something, you really have to plan your resources and make sure you have everything you need. It makes you feel like you're a real adventurer, planning out what they've got to get before they go out for their latest caper. But I should probably mention the fact that you get a set amount of food for your Digimon every day from a... Meat farm! Yes, you heard me right. A meat farm. 
How the hell are they growing meat in the ground and what the hell is this meat from? Silent breed is people! I love this game, I really do. But while you're babysitting your monster, you also have to train up their stats for battle. Unlike in something like Pokemon where you level up with XP, in this game you level up each individual stat. There's a gym machine for each stat and every time you use one of these you get points in that stat. And there's your usual stuff like health, magic points, offense, defense, speed and brains that all do what they say on the tin. There's a day and night cycle in the game so you really have to manage everything you want to get done in a day. When you're training up your Digimon you get into this really addictive rhythm of training stats, grabbing food and taking them to the little Digiboy's room. This game almost gets a hypnotic hold over me every time I play through it with me going I'll just do one more thing and then I'll go to bed. And you are training your Digimon for the random battles in this game that occur when you leave the safety of the town. You can see all the enemy Digimon roaming about and if you get too close a battle ensues. And sometimes it can get really nervy when you're trying to avoid battles because the enemy AI on these guys can be a pain in the ass to avoid. And the battles in this game operate like no other game with your Digimon pretty much doing whatever it wants in battle. Which can get a bit frustrating early on with your Digimon just running about and doing nothing that honestly gets me like this sometimes. Turn around! Concentrate on the game! But once you level up your Digimon's brain stat a bit, you start to get a bit more control over them, which makes it feel less like pulling teeth. The only action-based thing you have to do in combat is when your monster's special meter fills up and you have to mash the shoulder buttons to power it up. This can be a little bit annoying because if you activate your special at the wrong time, the enemy can just cancel out your special with a hit. But this combat style really just gives this game its sort of simulation feel that I really vibe with. Depending on what Digimon you have, they have access to different sets of moves and once you learn a move, it's available to all future Digimon. And the way you learn moves is kind of dumb, you have to fight a Digimon with the move you want and there's a tiny chance you'll learn the move. Sometimes I fight an enemy trying to get a move for ages and never get it half the time and I just settle for the bad moves and power level. But you aren't just leveling up your stats for battles, you're also doing it so your Digimon can evolve into bigger and better forms. You start off with baby Digimon, then go rookie and champion, finally finishing up with an ultimate if you know what you're doing anyway. Because this game is just obtuse as hell if you're not playing with a guide because it literally tells you nothing. That's a clean burning hell I tell you what! And after a few days of life your beloved Digimon will pass away and be reincarnated with you having to start all over again. Which was always heartbreaking as a kid because you get really attached to your little demon. Getting up to the rookie form is pretty much a given but after that all bets are off really and here's why. You have to meet a bunch of stat targets that you don't know about to get the Digimon you want. But there's also other factors like weight, care mistakes and numbers of battle that come into play. If you manage to hit three of these factors you will get the Digimon you want. But if you played this game as a kid you likely never got the Digimon you wanted. You would just have to randomly race stats and hope you hit these targets that the game wants. There's age gates on each level of Digimon and if you haven't got the stats where they need to be in time you're out of luck. But don't worry Digitamer if your rookie has not hit any of the goals that it needs to you'll be given the wonderful gift that is Numemon. I do legitimately love this little poop demon, I must say. Maybe it's because of all the time I spent with various different Numemon as a kid or the incel Numemon from the anime. Since I saved you lady, now will you go out with me, huh? No! If you played this game as a kid like I did, there's no way in hell you didn't end up with this little guy at some point. For the uninitiated, Numemon is one of the worst Digimon in the game and a punishment for you sucking. I found this part really hard to do without laughing. This Digimon will eat any poo that's been left on the ground by other Digimon and they even throw poo as moves as well. I'm sad that I lack the talent to make this stuff up. But that's not all on the poo front as well because if you let your Digimon poo too much on the floor they will end up turning into a giant yellow poo. I'm the great and mighty poo and I will fling my scat at you. Digimon World really was just peak gaming wasn't it? It literally has everything you could want from a game. I hate to say it but I have a soft spot for the giant yellow turd as well. What? I love garbage. Playing this game as a kid without knowing what I was doing just made it feel like it was as hard as Dark Souls. And it kind of is actually. But I feel like this mystery was kind of part of the mystique of the game because you just want to figure out how it works. I probably spent hundreds of hours with this game as a kid trying to figure out what the hell was going on. I mean they could have chose to help you out a little bit. It's hilarious to me that as a kid I never beat this game without cheating in hundreds of hours but with knowing what I need to digivolve I can do it in about 10 hours. But to be fair this game is no slouch in the difficulty department because you basically have to rock around with a pharmacy of drugs if you want to succeed. The main problem is that if you want to take on the stronger enemies you have to use a lot of MP that can easily be constantly drained to zero. If you tried doing this game without items I feel like you would get absolutely flattened easy. If you look down you're gonna fall, you're gonna have a bad time. But once you have the help of a guide and your ultimate Digimon what are you going to be doing when you're not training I hear you ask? Well the whole goal of the game is to go out into this honestly for the time sprawling open world and find Digimon to recruit for your city. Every different stage of Digimon gives you a different value towards your city prosperity rating. And to beat the game you only have to get a rating of 50 which reveals the way to the final dungeon and the boss of this game. Usually you'll bump into a Digimon and they'll have lost their memory and they'll want to fight 
fight you like the first Digimon you recruit Agamon, who after you beat six ways to Sunday will go to the city and open an item storage bank and most Digimon will do something like this. Part of the fun of this game for me is slowly seeing the city go from this rundown abandoned city into a bustling digiplex. This element of the game kinda turns this game into a town builder of sorts and just adds more depth to the gameplay. But not all the Digimon you recruit are simple battles, a lot of them have interesting ways you get them to join the city. One of my favourite sagas of the game is the Ogamon story, which I'm pretty biased towards because Ogamon is one of my favourite Digimon. And I've been re-watching the anime lately so I have a bit more love for him and I realise he has the same voice actor as Jet from Cowboy Bebop and he's just so sassy. What makes you special, you oversized doggy chew toy? You hear rumor of a Digimon who has set up a gang of bandits that have been robbing people up in the mountains. You beat them up and have to follow them to their hideout where they escape and become a constant foil throughout most of the game. Every time you think he's finally sick of losing to you, he's like, no bro, I'm off again to cause mid-level mischief. My favorite little bit with him is the final arc where he takes over the mines just outside of the city. And you think he's gonna run off again, but he's like, all right bro, you, you finally got me. I just love Ogumon, he's such a git. But those mines where you take him on for the last time are an early recruitment that I always remember as well. You have to fight a Dramojimon who is in heat for some reason, which leads to you saying you'll help get to the bottom of the mystery of the hot mines. And then you have to do the classic helper Dramojimon dig for a wall by taking out the dirt one cart at a time with your Digimon. I mean, technically you can just bugger off and come back a few days later, but I want it done now, damn it, I'm impatient. Which leads to you finding a rogue Merrimon that is causing trouble in the mines and a thematic battle takes place. And I love the way this game does storytelling because all the little adventures are so fun and they really make it feel like every encounter is an episode of the anime. But there are some recruitments that are pretty dumb and annoying and two stick out in my mind more than anything else. Centaurmon and Monochromon. When you go into a random area of the jungle section of the game, Centaurmon starts shooting at you from a distance. I remember the first time I came across this and I was very confused and annoyed as to what I was supposed to do. Of course there's a way through the maze but it's completely random and you have to be prepared with healing items because he will shoot you a few times. You have to get to a correct sign to have the Centaurmon stop shooting at you. What kind of guy is just like, I was testing you by trying to murder you, calm down. You can manipulate the randomness by where you walk first but obviously I didn't know that as a kid. I have no knowledge of any of this! This is so bizarre! But Centaurmon is only mildly annoying compared to the pure hellscape that is recruiting Monochromon. For this one you have to visit Monochromon at his store in the mountains and he'll ask you to man his shop for a couple of hours. And this is of course a test to see if you're worthy of having this guy come back to your city. This mini game right here is one of the most annoying and nonsense filled things in the whole game. Basically when you manage the shop customers will come in and you have to try and squeeze as much money out of them as you can. Capitalism ho! Different Digimon have different tolerances for your crap, so you have to be very careful with who you rinse for cash. But the randomness is part of what makes this minigame so infuriating. Sometimes a Digimon will seem happy with a deal, but walk out for seemingly no reason. This bloke won't haggle. Won't haggle? Another thing that makes this so frustrating is that the items the Digimon come in for are pretty much completely random. So you could be perfectly haggling away like the best merchant in all of Persia, but if you get a bad set of items that the customers want, you can't win. And it's not like this minigame is a quick time waste because it wastes away hours of your Digimon's life with every attempt. There's three items that they come in for, meat, porta potties and medicine. The most important one of these being the medicine. If you don't get at least a couple of these upsailed in a run, you're completely boned in terms of winning this minigame. And another under the hood hilarious thing is that what type of Digimon you have will change the item odds. Of course the game never tells you this, so you might be doing it with a Digimon that's unfavourable, driving yourself nuts like I have before. However, the icing on the annoyance of this is that the number of profit you have to get is absolutely insanely high with you needing 3200 profit, which even when you're doing good you can barely hit. So basically nothing induces rage in me quite like this slice of the game and you need the salesman skills of Billy Mays or Phil Swift to get through it. What's there to think about? I mean you told me you liked it. You asked me 10,000 questions, I answered every single one of them. There are a few recruitments where I'm just thinking how the hell was child me supposed to figure that out without a guide? There's a crop of Digimon in this game that appear on certain screens of the game on a 5% chance every time you enter that screen. The prime example being Piximon in the jungle area, which is a pretty reasonable one because this screen you go through quite a lot. I think everyone who's played this game remembers the first time they encountered Piximon randomly showing up. We all thought, ah, this, this little tiny Digimon, he ain't gonna be hard, let's fight him, only to be destroyed by this little pink fella. But the example of Mamamon and Metal Mamimon are a little bit more questionable because they are in spots you barely visit. But I guess this is a cool little secret because you don't exactly need all the Digimon to finish the game anyway. I remember being really surprised about those two when I replayed this as an adult because I didn't even know they existed. But for me the best recruitment minigame comes up on the frozen plains of Friesland in the great north of File Island. 
you find a little penguin mon who challenges you to a game of curling and if you beat him he comes to the town. It's a simple one but I always remember it and it's just so random that there's a full on curling mini game in this. But listen you kid, don't get caught in the Canadian syndrome. There's also a couple of kinder dungeons in this game where you have to go through a big gauntlet to recruit a strong Digimon. The one I remember most from when I was a kid was Greylord's Mansion which looks very Resident Evil. You can only go in here if you have a virus type Digimon which makes getting entry with an ultimate a bit limited. And that's the same for the other dungeon in this game where you need a vaccine type to enter which is kinda cool. But I just love the feel and design of this mansion and you sort of have to do some mild puzzling to get through this one. You find that the doors are mostly locked and you come across a key and then a passed out vampire Digimon Myotismon, who is passed out because he is a big baby who is unable to feed himself because his henchmen have gone AWOL. He's just like he was in the anime. You go grab him some bloody human steak or whatever that is supposed to be and he's back to his normal self for now. And you later hear rumour that he's gone missing and you have to go investigate and find out a Devimon has done something to him. This leads to this awesome fight with a Skull Greymon that's always creeped me out since his appearance in the anime. This section of the game is just so memorable and unlike other stuff in the game and it just feels a bit point and click inspired. The other dungeon of sorts is much less interesting with you going for an ice dungeon to recruit an Angemon. There is however another kind of dungeon that requires you to have the best boy Numamon for. Deep in the misty woods there's a town called Toy Town and if you bring a Numamon here it will instantly evolve into its final form Monzamon. Which I just love because it's like throwing a bone to us kids who are absolutely sucking at this game. And this whole little micro dungeon is a whole lot of fun and I just love the toy aesthetic of it. Oh yeah, and at certain points you find aliens, cause you know, this game is wild. It's most likely space alien based. The most insane recruitment of all is when you have to recruit one of my favourite Digimon of all time, Etamon. Sure, the process of getting this guy back to the city isn't anything crazy, you just get to a certain point and then you can fight him. But what makes his recruitment interesting is what happens after you recruit him. It's pretty crazy for a kid's game. Unlike most Digimon, he goes outside the city because everyone hated him, which is pretty on brand and I can relate to that being a misanthrope myself. It's what he says about this that's the shocking part. He says, When I tried to make my own hair, I'm in the city. I was kicked out. Based. Well, I don't remember that one, and I probably didn't know what a harem was at the time, for better or worse. As you go through the game and recruit all these different Digimon, the world around you will slowly open up as well. At the start of the game, you can really only go to the woods and the mines, but rapidly it opens up as you go. For example, after you complete the mines, you have access to the Gear Savannah area, which is like an African plain. And further in that area, you have the Misty Trees place, which is the most aesthetically pleasing part of the game for me. This beautiful looking area paired with one of the best songs in the game just brings a smile to my face every time I get here. And to the east zone, once you jump on a bunch of Koalamon's heads, you open up the tropical jungle zone which later opens up further once you hear rumours of an invisible bridge that leads to the mountain area. I'll never forget this bit of the game where your character goes and tries out the rumours for himself, and the mountain area then leads up to Freeze Land as well which can connect back round to the other areas of the game. It gives this game a massive feel even though it isn't really that big of a game, but as an adult I still have a great time exploring. And that's probably why I still love this game to this day, adventuring around this world sucks me in every time I play it. While this game isn't exactly perfect, I would say it's a flawed masterpiece and a lot of its faults give it its charm. And I'll never forget all the time I spent playing this game with the album Discovery by Daft Punk playing in the background. I don't know why, but I got that album and this game around the same time and they just sense memory together forever in my brain. I have so many happy memories playing this game with my stepbrother as well, we used to try and figure it out together. And we used to train up Digimon to fight each other with, which was a thing you could do in this game with memory cards that I never mentioned. Digimon World is a perfect game for me because it's all about adventure and micromanaging, which are things I love. And the whole angle of fathering your Digimon just gets me so attached to them and makes it all the sadder when it's time for them to pass. This will always be one of my favourite games of all time, and if you haven't played it, what are you doing? Go play it. It really is the high point of the series, and it's really a shame that they ditched this gameplay style for a while in this series of games. So let's move on to the second game, which I've been dreading covering since I started this video. It is evolving just backwards. Digimon World 2 released a year after the release of the first game in Japan, with America getting it a year later and the rest of us never getting it. After how much I enjoyed the first game, I was very excited for this game because I saw it advertised in previews at the time. Then there was nothing and it just never came out here and I never knew why because I didn't have access to the internet. But my theory as to why we didn't get this sequel is because the original Digimon World had only just been released in the UK and Europe when America was getting the second entry. I don't know if this conspiracy theory is accurate though because we would end up getting Digimon World 3 as Digimon World 2003 later down the road. 
so I don't know. I've stumbled onto a major company conspiracy, Mac. How about that for stress? I always wanted to play this game, but I always heard it was kind of bad, so even in the emulation era, I never bothered trying it. I was always told that it went for a completely different gameplay style, and that just put me off it, if I'm being honest. All I wanted out of a Digimon World sequel was a somewhat more streamlined version of the original with newer Digimon. The reviews it got at the time of its release were brutal and gave it a real kicking, so maybe I didn't miss much. But that said, the original game got awful reviews as well, because game reviewers have awful tastes and their mothers smell like elderberries. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like, uh, your opinion, man. But were the reviewers and everyone who told me this game was awful right? Well, I wasn't missing much, I'll put it that way. Digimon World 2 starts off with our protagonist being taken into some building where we're going to become a cadet tamer and we get to name ourselves. And the very first thing I noticed was the fact that all the characters in this game walk like they've just dumped arse. Why do they walk like this? We find out that we're nearing the end of our training to become a Digimon tamer in this world and we have one final mission to pass. And we get introduced to what we're going to be doing for most of this game which is dungeon crawling in a weird tank thing. It controls exactly the same as something like Pokemon Mystery Dungeon with the enemies all moving when you move. And when you collide with the enemies on the overworld you get taken to a battle screen which operates like any JRPG. You get a party of free Digimon and it's your job to clear out various dungeons to progress the story. My main problem with the battles are the fact that it's so damn slow and very simple so it just gets old really fast. At first I was having a really good time with this game but how slow the game is and how much grinding it expects you to do sapped any fun out of it for me. But we'll get into that more later. After you complete the training mission you go back to the town and they say you pass and you're set loose to join one of three guard teams. And this is essentially like picking your starter in a Pokemon game, you have Black Sword, Blue Falcon and the Gold Hawks. Each team specialises in a different type of Digimon and because I'm such an edgy sad boy I went with Black Sword who specialise in virus types. You believe in your worthless friends and you believe that your dreams can come true. Dreams do not exist for the stupid. And for joining the moody loners I get Demi Devimon as my starter who I absolutely love, he's a git in the anime. Then we're basically allowed to do as we please in tackling the first dungeon of the game. You go around in your little tank thing battling enemies and looting chests that are strewn around the dungeons. The dungeons are all randomly generated and you have to adventure around and find these panels that lead to the next floor. Once you get deep down enough you'll have to fight the dungeon boss, beat them and the dungeon is complete. Your tank has a stat called EP that depletes by one every time you move in a dungeon which sends you back to base camp when it's empty. And it also costs you money if you let it get to zero and you have to use the autopilot option in the menu before this happens. And this is another thing that just slows the game down unnecessarily because this game expects you to do a lot of level grinding. Which this system of being forced out of the dungeon every 5 seconds makes more of a hassle than it should be. Because in many ways this battle system is more basic than your normal JRPG because there isn't even normal attacks that you can use, everything uses MP. And like I said earlier the battles are so slow which is mainly because of the disc loading and the fact that every time you attack there's a ludicrously long animation. I do love the graphics in the battle sequences, these sprites just have a lovable chonky look to them. As you battle Digimon you gain experience like you would in any other RPG game and they level up accordingly. You start off with just one Digimon but you can add Digimon to your squad by giving them gifts. These gifts will depend on what type of Digimon you're going after. Virus Digimon like getting skateboards for example because they're so bad. I'm a pretty cool dude and that's just a fact. How you do this is a bit obtuse but you're supposed to give them a gift on the overworld before you go into combat. Then after you beat them 6 ways till Sunday they might just join your squad if you're a bad enough dude. This system feels really buggy and unsatisfying, it's not like catching stuff in Pokemon that's for sure. And when you hit certain level targets you can evolve your Digimon at a special place in town. And you might be asking yourself, Goblin, that doesn't sound that bad, why were you saying this game requires so much level grinding? Well let me tell you hypothetical person who only exists in my alcohol ridden brain, every Digimon for some reason in this game has a level cap that is really low until you combine two champion level or above Digimon into one Digimon with a DNA evolution. So that means you're going to have to level up two Digimon and waste them back into a lower form over and over again to get them to a higher level. And when you combine this with the slow system of adventuring and getting XP it turns this game into a massive slog. You're just in a loop of going into a dungeon, maybe getting in about 10 fights at a slow pace and then sitting through another few loading screens to get back to grinding again. And it's not like the story in this game is riveting enough to pull it through. I mean I like that in this game Digimon and humans just exist in the same world but there's basically no adventure or intrigue. They use the system very similar to this in Digimon Cyber Sleuth but those games did it a lot better. I'm really going to have to cover those two games at some point on this channel. Let me know if you want to see that, wink. Now that I finally played this game I'm kinda glad we never got this game in the UK, cause it kinda sucks. I mean it's not the worst thing I've ever played or anything, it's just a really bland dungeon crawler with a Digimon coat of paint. Maybe just this one time the game's journalists were actually correct for once. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. Am I wrong? You're not wrong Walter, you're just an asshole. Okay then.
Digimon World 3 was released two years after the second game in Japan and would be the last release for the series on the PS1. And unlike the second game, this one actually got released in the UK and Europe as Digimon World 2003, so this one I actually played back in the day. I remember having a decent opinion of it, but for whatever reason I didn't really get that far in the game and upon playing it again I can see why. I think it's maybe because it was a bit of a budget release game that had a 2D art style and I thought I was above that at this point because I was balls deep into the PS2 era. But coming back to it now all these years later, I absolutely love the art style of this game, it looks gorgeous. And I was actually pleasantly surprised by this game because it's actually way more fun than I gave it credit for. Our story starts off with our protagonist Junior waiting for his two friends on a street corner and you get to see the art style properly that reminds me of Mega Man Battle Network for whatever reason. They arrive late and Junior does the angriest, most Italian hand gestures I've ever seen in a video game. And it turns out our gang of intrepid explorers are heading to the virtual reality online game called Digimon Online. What a twist! Before we enter the virtual reality world, we have to pick up our group of starters. Unlike a Pokemon game, you get three starters here. The first set of starters are Kotamon, which is like a Kendo suit Digimon, and two old favourites, Renamon and Patamon. Then the second set contains Monmon, that sounds like some French nonsense, and Agamon, and another Renamon. The last pack contains Kumamon, which is just a bear, but you also get Giamon and another Patamon. And I decided to go for the second pack because it has an Agamon in there who I love, and, you know, the main guy is a monkey! We then go into a Dragon Ball Z Saiyan ship that jacks us into the digital version of the Matrix. After copious amounts of tutorial nonsense, our Digimon are summoned and they follow us around kinda like Pikachu does in Pokemon Yellow, which is actually really cool. Following this, we get our first taste of the battles in this game, which are full 3D unlike the rest of the game. I mean, they're a bit plain and laggy, but I like how the Digimon look. With that out of the way, we're pretty much free to roam the world at our leisure, with our goal being to beat a bunch of gym leader type figures and become the best tamer around. Much like the second game, this one completely diverts from the original Digimon World formula of pet raising for a simple JRPG structure. But unlike the clunky and boring second game, this one actually manages to be fun in its own right. And even though it opts for a completely different game structure and setup, it still has the aesthetic and feel of the first game. Even though this game is more 2D, it still has those weird avant-garde looking areas like the first game with the random cables just jutting around everywhere. The graphics honestly do look beautiful on the overworld sometimes. But there is these weird blue card shaped things that junk up the screen in some areas. Now it might be my emulator making these worse than it should be, but sometimes it covers up big parts of the screen, which certainly has a way of ruining the beauty of the backgrounds and the environments you're running through. The game functions like your bog standard JRPG with the battles being very similar to something like Final Fantasy. You get your standard attack and a bunch of options for magic spells that are different for each Digimon. Your Digimon fight one at a time and you can only have three Digimon in your squad at one time. It really just feels like a Pokemon game honestly. This might be the first Digimon game where it really does feel like they're just copying Game Freak's homework a bit. I mean you even have to fight other Digimon trainers like you do in Pokemon but this isn't a bad thing because it's quite entertaining. I went into this expecting it to be an okay game but I ended up getting addicted and really enjoying myself. If I wasn't making a video, I probably would have played through and beat the whole ass game. The only thing this battle system really adds to the basic RPG formula is that when you level up your Digimon, they get access to different evolutions. And you can evolve your Digimon into various forms at will, and you get more as you level up, which keeps things interesting. To get certain forms, you have to raise your Digimon stats at the gym outside of town, which is a nice callback to the first game. To do this training, you have to use TP, which you slowly gain over the course of your little guys leveling up. You even have to deck out your Digimon with swords and armor like a real RPG as you go through the game, which is kind of stupid because they use their claws and whatnot in combat? That doesn't make sense. You get random battles as you walk around in any area outside of the city and this game can be brutal when you start out. And if you get injured you can't really die or anything but you will have to heal up again at the inns scattered around in the different towns. You can't catch any wild Digimon though sadly but there is a couple of extra recruitable Digimon scattered around the lands. This game is really basic and it's much like Pokemon, it's a baby's first JRPG but I don't know why, I just find it kind of enjoyable. I probably just have something wrong in my brain that's just addicted to the endorphin hits of level grinding and acquiring more power and wealth. It's the trash, isn't it's it? It's the sweet, sweet trash. The world in this game is just so fun to explore around and it gives me the same whimsical mystery vibes from the first game. But also like a lot of JRPGs, this game has a card game crowbarred into it and it's a big part of the game in many ways. And let me tell you this right now, this ain't no Triple Triad or Gwent from The Witcher 3, that's for damn sure. I honestly still don't have a great handle on how it works, but it seems like there's very little strategy involved. You have a deck of cards and you get dealt monsters and special cards and you have to try and play as much powerful stuff as you can in one turn to get the win. After you and your opponent have played all your cards, the one whose cards are more powerful overall wins. First one to two wins is the victor. This game is honestly awful because it just boils down to have the best cards and you win. It's like if EA made a card game. I activate my credit card! 
I mean, it's cool that it's here, I just wish it was, you know, actually fun to play. But let's get into my first major problem with this game, and that is, half the time you have literally no idea where you have to go. For example, the first sort of quest you have to go on is... A quest to find some boots so you can kick a tree to make a Digimon that gives you cards appear. And you have to go find this kid's lost Gabamon card in town, which is more annoying than it sounds because they give you no indication of where it is. It's at the inn on a random shelf with no prompt. How the hell was I supposed to figure that out on my own? For him only to tell you when you return that you have to find a Vmon to get these boots, sending us on another wild goose chase with basically no clues other than to go where people meet. Which is some place called the Lamb Chop in town, and they tell us he's in some place called the Wind Prairie, so we have to find that with no indication of where it is. And sometimes this game isn't exactly the easiest to navigate, but maybe I'm just impatient and I want everything spoon fed to me like a baby. Doing anything in this game is always this obtuse. Sure, it encourages exploration and talking to everyone, but it makes the game feel very slow. And I can see why I bounced off this game as a kid, but playing it with a guide handy makes it less annoying. It's just people sending you on wild goose chases over and over again, like for example the first gym leader type character. You have to go track him down to some hidden ruins that has this annoying maze to solve before you can even get in the building. And then you get to him and he sends you away to find some other guy on a random mountain somewhere before you can fight him. But these are all just minor gripes really, because I find this game so charming and I love the warm glow of an atmosphere it gives off. It really just gives off that vibe of a flawed hidden gem, much like the first game does. And one thing I'll never get sick of is how much of a woman-hating incel our main character is to the female companion in this game. Super based. The American people are tired of women. No. <laughs> Don't do it. This is a game I'll definitely be coming back to to finish later down the line when I'm not making a video on it. If you're an RPG grind loop addicted gremlin like me, maybe you'll find something to like in this game too. I was honestly surprised by how much I liked this game because I was expecting to just sort of feel a bit meh on it. For me, this game basically does what the second game was trying to achieve and does it a whole lot better. This is definitely one of the better Digimon World games. Especially compared to the next game we have to talk about now, sadly. Digimon World 4! No, God! No, God, please, no! Digimon World 4 was released three years after the release of the third game, and this is the first release for the series on the PS2 generation of consoles. And as I hinted at just a few seconds ago, this game is quite frankly awful and without a doubt my least favourite Digimon World game. It just feels like a pure soulless cash grab with no hint of originality about it. If you told me this was originally a different game that got Digimon pasted into it, I believe you. Sure, so far all of the games have strayed off the feel of the original game, but they at least had an echo of similarity. But I should probably stop delaying it and just get into the game proper, even though I'd rather take on some Chinese water torture. Digimon World 4 starts with a character select screen where you get the choice of Doramon, Agamon, Vimon, and Giamon. And this screen is where you realise the game is a multiplayer game, and there's nothing wrong with that inherently. But this is a Digimon World game, and they've always historically been single player games. You can tell that they just slapped the Digimon World moniker on it to sell a couple more copies. And I'm definitely not just salty about this because I'm some weird hermit who literally has no friends. People don't like me, and people are probably never gonna like me, so I will never like people. I don't need anyone, I've got free rocks and sustenance from the drippings of the ceiling. But anyway, after that demented tangent, I decided to pick Agamon because he is obviously the best boy. We are then transported to the home server of the digital security guard where our Digimon is going to work or something. And there's these things called digi-elves everywhere, and as a goblin there's nothing I hate more than elves, so that takes a couple points away from this game already. Alright, listen to me you knife your piece of We get instantly called into the commander's office because we're obviously such a big deal. Hello, I'm Agamon, you've seen my TV video films I assume. You'll first notice that even for a PS2 game, this game looks hideous and I ran into my first problem. This game is about as easy to navigate as the lost catacombs of Egypt covered in mummy remains and Vaseline. Be still... still... Juicy. Yes. Everything looks the same in this hub world and you can easily get lost just looking for stuff which is aggravating. And as I'll get into later, we have to come back to this hub world a lot more so it's a constant issue. So we find the commander and they give us the mission of going to find out what's happening to Leomon who they've lost contact with. We are then finally shown how the game works and you might have noticed that our Agamon is holding an axe which will give you some idea of what we're in for. Right, so this game is an incredibly basic hack and slash game that's added in Diablo-like looting mechanics. Because, you know, when I look at Digimon, that's the first thing I think. Would be so much better if we gave these Digimon a shank. Sword! <gasps> sword! sword. Yeah, sword. Oh. You have one button to attack with that activates a hit depending on what weapon you have equipped. There's a couple of different weapon types, but it don't matter what you pick, you're gonna have a bad time. 
You can block, but there's basically no point in doing this because most of the time it's easier to just hit and run. There is a few different attacks you can use like spiral attacks, but it feels like none of it ever works right. There's a charge attack you can do by holding down the attack button, but using this most of the time just feels pointless. You can also pull off spells by bringing up a menu with R1, and these are about as useful as you would think, and a pain to aim. And thus concludes the tutorial. You've seen everything this mediocre game has to offer in terms of gameplay. With that, the game lets you out into the first dungeon of this fetid hellscape that they have the gall to call a video game. Yeah, this doesn't feel safe. So yeah, basically this game is like a Poundland version of Gauntlet with you going through a dungeon and defeating enemies and bosses as you go. The combat just feels so unsatisfying, you literally just hit and run, hit and run, until the enemy dies. And the enemies at the start take so many hits to die that it makes the game incredibly boring. The game was so difficult off the bat that I thought I was doing something wrong and that I was terrible at it. It actually led me to googling about this to find out if it was just me having trouble with the game. And I found a bunch of forum postings from other people complaining about the difficulty of the game and talking about how awful it is. From what I can gather this game always treats you like you're playing with four people so if you're playing alone you're really up against it. I don't know if this is actually true, but I can believe it because this game kept absolutely kicking my ass. You do earn experience in this game so you can level up, but you have to do a lot of grinding to get a level up. And the gameplay in this game is mostly the problem, so why the hell would I want to do more of it? You do get new weapons and armor as you go through the dungeon, but they can't even implement something this simple correctly. For the weapons, you can't just pick them up off the floor and use them, because that would be too simple, wouldn't it? You have to go back to the hub world, which you can only do with an item that teleports you there, and sit for a loading screen. Then you have to find the weapon equipped person through this hub area that is basically a maze, like on the level of that interdimensional stairs painting. Then here, you can switch out your weapons. Why couldn't they just let you do that in the goddamn menu like a normal game? They're having a laugh today. Well, they're winning. Yeah, they're having a laugh. There is slight elements of jumping about and platforming, but it's just about as shallow as everything else in this game. There's also lots of traps strewn about that are just kind of annoying and add basically nothing. I did manage to get to a boss at some point to see what the fights were like in this, and it was just as crushingly difficult and uninteresting as the rest of the game. I was determined to at least get through the first dungeon of this game, seeing as I was doing a video on it. So I got in a loop of killing simple enemies until I ran out of health and teleporting back to the hub world to heal up for a bit. And this was about as monotonous as it sounds with this game's awful gameplay and the fact that level ups take an absolute age to get. But I was still getting my ass handed to me in the deeper sections of this dungeon and it was at this point I just had to concede defeat because I just can't subject myself to this game anymore. I hate it. If I wasn't making a video I probably would have turned it off about 5 minutes in. Honestly, the lengths I go for you lot. <sighs> the things I do for love. I did look and apparently there's some digivolving later on locked behind some special missions which sound dumb as well. So yeah, to me, without a doubt, this is the worst game in the Digimon World series, at least two had some redeeming features. I bet there will be some defenders of this game down in the comments saying it's fun with friends. But anything is better when you've got friends and I'm obviously just salty because my two favourite rocks left me alone in my cave. I better not see any of those goddamn comments! You do and I'll f***ing gut you like a fish! Digimon World Redigitized was released a whopping 7 years after the release of Digimon World 4 in 2012 on the PSP. It's insane to me that we waited this long for another title in this series for it to only be released on a dying system that was a short year or two from being discontinued. And the real kicker is that it was only ever released in Japan and I can understand that because it would take ages to translate and the PSP would probably be even more irrelevant by that point. But they ported a enhanced version to the 3DS so that argument kind of falls through. There was even a campaign at the time from Digimon World fans to get the 3DS version ported to Western Shores that garnered tens of thousands of signatures which was to no avail sadly. And do you want to know what the even more annoying thing about this whole situation is? The game is absolutely fantastic. Which makes me even more frustrated that we never got this game in the West but we got the awful Digimon World 4 that we just talked about. After three sequels to the original Digimon World game it finally returns to the Monster Dad simulator gameplay of the first game and I bloody love it. I can easily say without a shadow of a doubt this is the second best game I've played so far in this video. It took what the first game did and modernised it somewhat. And for a PSP game, this game is a bit of a looker, this would honestly not look too out of place on a PS2. I was not expecting to fall in love with this game as much as I did, it only took the fifth sequel for them to strike gold again. During this part of the video we will be looking at the PSP version of this game because I couldn't get the 3DS version working for whatever reason. But from what I've heard it isn't so majorly different that it should matter for the purposes of this video. But I just quickly want to take a moment to applaud the work of a group called Operation Decoded who are the reason we're all able to play this game in English. You're my superstar.
Digimon World Redigitized starts with a snazzy anime looking intro that kind of goes like the intro to the first game which I like. We see that the Digimon in this game are related to some PC game that has a phone app related to it or something. I really like the little scene where we get a snapshot of the digital world with all the monsters playing around in an almost spirited away looking setting. We then see that our protagonist in stark contrast to the first game's one actually has friends. Already can't relate to this guy. I only ever relate to sad, miserable men who are working unfulfilling day jobs that sap their vital essence away like a myotis mom. If only I'd done things different is a phrase that pops into my head every day. We see that our main character plays the Digimon game with his two friends, Nico and Akiho, who joins us throughout our adventures. Some stuff that didn't get translated happens here, and all the gang is debating and flabbergasted about something. I assume it has something to do with what you know is about to happen, which is them getting sucked into the digital realm. For some reason, our character starts typing digitize and rebirth into the computer in English for whatever reason. He then has an epiphany and types re-digitize. Oh my god, he did it. He said the thing. Do you get it? Like the title of the game. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! And with that, the gang is finally transported to the world of Digimon, or the Digimon world, if you will. We awaken in the railroad plains, which has the look and feel of the original game down to a T, in my opinion. We meet our Digimon partner, which is an Agamon, and you have no choice in the matter, but that's okay. Agamon is a good boy. We get to name our partner, and I've been naming them all Lemmy in this video, so why not again? It's supposed to be loud, it's me, innit? So our boy Lemmy says we should go to the city, and maybe we can work out how to get me home. And we have to do our first tutorial battle here as we're interrupted by a Gabamon with a dark aura. The combat works exactly like it did in the original game except everything just feels smoother and more streamlined. The only thing that's changed somewhat is when the special meter fills in this game you have to do a timed button press to power your special move rather than button mashing. With that out of the way we get our first look at the new and improved file city which looks really cool. Like I said earlier, it gives off that spirited away vibe with it being more of an actual city than the first game. But I do have one problem with this, and that's the fact that in the first game you start off with a sparse collection of huts. And throughout the course of the game it comes to life with all the Digimon that you've recruited to the city. But here it starts off big, so you don't get the fun of seeing the city change as you return to it. But it does actually get a lot more populated as you go, with more Digimon out and about, and it's not a major negative or anything, I would have just liked to see more buildings come in or something. With that aside, we head over to see our old friend Digimon from the first game, which just filled me full of nostalgic joy to see. Digimon in the first game was always such a cool Yoda-like figure, and him returning is a great little nod to the first game. Trust me, there's lots of nods to the first game and that makes me a very happy goblin boy. We find out from Digimon that there's more humans that have been sucked into this world and he tells us to go find them. At this point we are kind of still on rails but we have to go look around the town and see it's laid out pretty much the same as the first game. You have a meat field again that gives you food on a daily basis, you have a gym where you can train the same stats as before, and you still have to go to the toilet and watch your Digimon poop. There was doo doo feces thrown all over the walls. But I mean at least they have the class and decency to give your Digimon a privacy screen in this game. There is some changes to how you do the training in this game, but we'll get into that proper later on, methinks. Our first task is to go out into the railroad plains and defeat that same Gabamon we fought at the beginning of the game, which is a callback to the first game in which you had to fight an Agamon first, but here we have his opposite. And he even does the same job that Agamon did in the first game, which I think is kind of neat. We return to Digimon, who tells us again like the first game, Digimon have been going mental and it's our job to recruit them back to the city. We are told about some things called Memorial Stella that have stopped working in various areas and might be the cause of the island's problems this time. With the setup out of the way, we head outside to see that our friend Nico is here as well with his Galmon. We then see our female companion who is also here with her partner Biomon, then with the gang in tow we head off to investigate the Memorial Stella in the railroad plains. And this is the first area that the game takes a big departure from the first game, instead of the isolated open world feel of the first game, they go for a JRPG kind of setup for this game. The first game had its events and story beats, but you could beat the game while missing a lot of stuff. But this game is a more on rails affair, with you having to go through everything in a very specific order. Obviously you can still go off on your own and recruit Digimon and train if you want to, but you can't move on till you progress the story. It's not necessarily worse than how the first game does things, it's just different, and I for one really enjoyed the new setup. It took the skeleton of the original game and try to do something completely different with it. These memorial stella are the main point of the game and you will usually be in one area until you can clear a story event or boss fight at these memorial stella. You are going to these places to collect things called garbage data which is very on brand for me. That's my character! I'm the trash man! And these bits of garbage data are the things that are going to help the gang get out of the digital world and save the real world in the process which is par for the course. The gang expands as you go with the introduction of Mirei and Yuya who are sort of frenemies throughout the course of the game. The story while nothing special by any means is enjoyable enough for a game like this and it keeps the game plodding along. So basically every time you clear a memorial stellar that area is completed and you can now move on to a new area. 
Every one of these is full of Digimon to recruit back to File City that all do different stuff like in the first game. I think the first game did these recruitable Digimon a lot better because there was more lead up and intrigue in the first game. But here most of the recruiting boils down to go find them, beat them up and then they'll come back to the city. This didn't ruin the game or anything because there's still a few Digimon that you have to do interesting or funny stuff to recruit. Like this Goblinmon that pranks you by making you think you can't cross a bit of purple water without throwing rocks in it, later revealing that it was all a funny ruse. Have you seen a prank please? I think I'm looking at one right now. However, a lot of these are time based with you having to help with something and then leave and come back which is kind of annoying. There's also more than a few ones that require your Digimon to have certain stats which I don't mind so much. Certain Digimon will require you to have a certain type of Digimon or move like this Impmon for example, who wants you to retrieve a big anemone which in the first place is hard to find because if you're like me you don't even know what that is. I had to look up the pronunciation, anemone, it, it's, it's really hard to say. But once you find the thing you realise you can only collect it if you have a fire move for some strange reason. There's quite a number of these that are obtuse or require certain moves, but I can't be too harsh because there was much more bizarre ones in the original game. There was a lot of little nods to the original here with the recruitables that made me really happy though. Like this Biomon that needed directions to get out of a cave that works kind of in a similar way to you trying to catch her in the first game. Or the full shop mini game with this Tentamon that gave me a panic attack because I thought we were in for Monochrome on 2 Electric Boogaloo for a second. Daddy chill. What the hell is even that? This game hits that same balance that the first game did with you feverishly training your Digimon till they'll swallow and then continuing to adventure in an addictive loop. I don't know what it is about gameplay loops where it just goes from chill to crazy that appeals to me but it always does it for me. This game hooks me in the same way the first game does when it comes to the monster raising side of things. I get stuck in this time warp of just training different stats and going to get more meat and taking my Digimon to the toilet. It's so calming, I just can't pull myself away from it once I get stuck in this loop. It's like the same way I enjoy something like Stardew Valley. And in this game they've added in mega forms for all the Digimon where the first game only went up to Ultimates. And this adds a whole new level of planning to your Monster Dad simulator because getting a mega at first is a hard job. It will involve a lot of trips to the town Dr. Angemon. Him, him being a doctor just reminds me of one of those like faith healer guys. Because, you know, Angemon is like Digimon Jesus. I do like the fact that the game actually now gives you clues on how to get certain Digimon, unlike the first game that was basically impossible without a guide. I actually played through and beat this game for this part of the video. I was only going to get the gist of it and then write this part up, but I just got so into it. And I'm glad I did because I would have got a completely different opinion on this game if I didn't finish it. After getting reasonably far in a game using the usual Digimon World techniques of doing fast training and skipping through it, I was having a hard time getting Megas. Sure I could do it with the old methods but my Digimon would end up being weak and I started getting my ass kicked towards the tail end of this game. And this is because of one simple fact. I ignored the advanced training which is probably due to my boomer knowledge from the first game. In that game there was more advanced training that you could do that involved using a slot machine type thing that was pretty much pointless to use. So I assumed in this game the advanced training would be not that useful as well. That was the wrong assumption to make. They changed the higher levels of training into timing based mini games that will give a much higher stat boost if you can beat them. And early on I tried these and thought it was too hard and didn't bother with it but you have to do these if you want to beat this game. The mini games range in difficulty with the easiest ones being stuff like doing the special meter thing for attack or dodging bombs for speed. But the ones I hate the most are for health, defense and brains because they are difficult or make no goddamn sense. The prime contender being the health one which is just like the random slot machine from the first game. Or the defense one that brings up anger in me from a visceral place in my probably mostly Neanderthal DNA. You have to time a button press to stop this boxing glove from hitting you and it randomly springs whenever it feels like it. Sure that doesn't sound that hard but the timing is incredibly weird and counterintuitive feeling like you almost have to press it after it hits you and I bloody hate it. But if you master these mini games it makes it easy to get a beast monster and completely wreck this game. I sort of just got very good at the mini games that were a bit more reliable and skipped the mini games that are just too random. This does however ruin the kind of hypnotic state that the game puts me in at times but having a beast Digimon at the end makes it all worth it. Another thing that is given a lot more emphasis in this game is what moves your Digimon is using. It still works the same as before with you having to fight a monster with the move over and over again until you learn it. But in the old game if you had some slightly less than optimal moves you could breeze through the game still. Here though even if you have a total unit of a Digimon you're still going to struggle which I do like because it makes you work for a bit. Like for example my absolutely beast Metal Etamon that I decided to beat the game with. Because as I mentioned earlier I love all the trash Digimon and Etamon and his various forms are my favourite Digimon. I got the best boy a crown because he is a king and we all know it. You know because he talks like Elvis you know. It's called Karate man and only two kinds of people know it. The Chinese and the king. One of them is me. Oh yeah, you can give your Digimon accessories now, which I like. 
But anyway, I was having trouble winning with my Metal Etamon, even with him at max stats until I got him some better moves, because the enemies in this game hit hard. And a place where the enemies hit the hardest are a place that's received a big overhaul in this game, the Colosseum. In the first game, the arena was nothing more than a distraction, but in this game it's part of the main plot quite often, with you having to work your way through its various battles and flaws if you want to get further in the game. Even after I got my Metal Etamon better moves with maxed out stats, some of these battles were still actually really challenging. There's five different floors here that all have different rule sets that you can take part in. There's big lists of battles with different opponents and prizes you get for beating them, with you having to pass the test battle to unlock the harder floors of the Colosseum with the different rule sets. Other than free battles, there's also tournaments where you have to win a string of battles before you get the reward. On the first floor, it's just normal battles. Floor 10 are tameless, which means you can't give orders to your Digimon. Floor 20 is time battles, where you must be winning or kill the opponent before the time runs out. Floor 30 is double battles, which is exactly what it sounds like. And finally, you have floor 40, which has no special rules, except for the fact that everything on this floor is extra hard. I really enjoyed this overhauled Colosseum, and I got really addicted to going through it and beating all the battles like a meth-addicted lab rat. This is what I do instead of doing hard drugs with strippers. I could quit any time I want. <laughs> well, you tried to quit yesterday and you couldn't. All of this adds up to everything I've ever wanted out of a Digimon World 1 sequel. It's just a shame I had to wait this long to play it. If you're even mildly a fan of the first game, I highly recommend you do yourself a favour and play this game because it's amazing. I'm guessing that if you've made it this far into a Digimon World series retrospective, you probably will enjoy yourself. But we have one more game to go in this video that continues along the same lines of this game. But is it anywhere near as good as this game? Let's find out. Digimon World Next Order was released four years after the last game and it was released on another portable game system, the PlayStation Vita. But as is often the case in this winding road of a series, this version of the game was never released outside of Japan. However, thankfully, unlike the last game that never saw release outside of Japan, this one actually made it to our shores. In 2017, the game got ported over to the PS4 in full English, which I feel like was partially due to the fan outcry over the last game not getting released here. And unlike a lot of games in this series, this was one I actually played upon its initial release, and I remember being absolutely hyped for it at the time. I got my copy around the launch window, and I wasn't too keen on it, and I was actually kind of disappointed. You done fucked it up! I have no idea why I hated it at the time. I think it might have been because there was minimal guides out at the time and I just didn't know what the hell I was doing. Which I can see because this game in many ways is just as obtuse as the original game with some of the stuff it expects you to figure out. I think I also didn't know it was a port of a Vita game and thought they were doing my beloved series dirty with the graphics and polish in this game. So when I decided to make this video I thought this section would just be me ripping this game a new one because I remember it being kind of crap. But I'm glad this video has forced me to reevaluate this game because it's a lot better than I gave it credit for. Sure, it does have its elements that feel a little bit budget, but beneath the surface, there's a really deep and interesting game here. I was enjoying myself so much with this game that it actually halted up the production of this video by a couple of weeks. Because I wasn't going to be satisfied with my coverage until I beat everything this game had to offer. It didn't really glean me much more insight into the game, but I was genuinely having a blast playing it. Sometimes games just don't click with you at the time when you first played them, and this is a perfect example of that. I was legitimately sitting there while I was playing this, thinking to myself, why the hell did I hate this? It's amazing. But anyway, let's go over why Past Me was wrong about this game. I thought it was shit. I THOUGHT IT WAS SHIT! The game starts with you actually getting to pick the gender of your playable character, but there's no customization or anything. And we then see our character in record time getting sucked into the digital world with basically no build-up. At least buys a pint first. Our character awakens in a digital void where he is confronted by the last boss of the first game of Machine Drummond. And believe me, that's not the end of the nods to the first game in this one. There's quite a lot of that, and I appreciate it. This game then wastes absolutely no time and shows us how the battles are going to be working in this entry. It is pretty much the same as the other two games in this style, except for this time we have two partners at our disposal, which I both love and hate, but we will get into the implications of having two Digimon to raise later on. The battles are actually a little bit more simple in many ways, because you don't have commands like in the other two games. Well, you do, but they work very different in this entry, with you having to spend order points to directly control your partners. But most of the time you don't want to do this because you need to save the order points up to get specials. It's not worse, it's just different. You can do dual specials, which makes your Digimon set off their specials at the same time for massive of damage. Or you can EXE evolve your Digimon together to make them into a single Digimon wrecking crew under the right circumstances. This can only be done once a day though, so it's something you save for the most deadly of enemies. Other than that, there's nothing massively different to this setup and I really enjoy it, even if this one is definitely a little bit buggy. 
I had a lot of things go laggy and wrong during the battles in this game, more than any other in the series. I had a bunch of times where the frame rate would get all messed up and my Digimon would take ages to let off their specials. And that goes for a few things in this game, sadly it is a little bit rough around the edges. Oh dear lord they never fix the bugs. But there's nothing majorly game breaking, just mildly annoying stuff for the most part. With the Machine Drummond defeated we are whisked away to the town square of this game city, Floatia. And it's none other than our homeboy, our bestie for resty, the illustrious Digimon once again making an appearance. You always know you're in for a good time when the G-Meister is in town. He tells us that our partners have passed away and it's time for them to be reborn as in training Digimon. In this game we get a really nice selection of eggs to choose from. I ended up going with two of the same Digimon because I thought I would have less to think about that way. But I was wrong. I decided to name my two partners after the classic duo of Walter and Perry from the show Home Movies because they're deranged, just like me. I got the bloodlust! Me too! I wanna kill! kill. Let's kill. 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 kill! 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 So Digimon tells us that the evil monster that attacked us was this cute little blob down here. And basically loads of different Digimon have been turning into Machine Drummon and attacking stuff which is causing chaos. And as is tradition at this point, Digimon asks us to get to the bottom of this mystery and rebuild the town. With that we are given a little tour of the facilities and the layout of this new town we're going to be spending a lot of time in. It's the usual Digimon world setup, we have a meat field and a toilet and of course a gym. The training in this game isn't too dissimilar from the other games except for you have two Digimon to manage the stats of. Which initially was a bit annoying to me because I'm very dumb and it feels like rubbing your belly and patting your head at the same time. It just ended up leading to me making loads of notes of the different stat goals and extra requirements I needed to hit and I ended up liking the fact that you have two Digimon. It does annoy me a bit that your two Digimon could get out of sync with one living longer than the other which actually happened to me on my first playthrough. But I just made sure it didn't happen this time around playing the game. It is annoying when it happens though. The last game had that more action based advanced training options to optimize your training with but this game opts for something a little bit more simple. You just get a roulette wheel type thing that you have to stop on an icon to get a bonus which I like more than the last game's system. It's not very involved which allows me to get into my addictive training loop that zones me out and consumes me at the same time. This is what I do instead of having friends and going to parties. Where were you last night? Nowhere. Nowhere? That's right. Nowhere. Depending on where you place your Digimon and other random factors you'll have a higher or a lower chance of getting bonus stat points. A big mercy in this game over the other two games in this style is that the toilet is right next to the gym. It doesn't sound like a lot but it really is when you're training for hours on end. But while we're talking about the layout of the town I just want to say I love this town it actually starts off as a collection of shacks like in the first game. It helped give me that feeling I got from the first game when I was building up File City because the second game kind of is a giant city straight away. However it isn't perfect itself because it starts off small and cosy but at a certain point it just upgrades straight into a giant city overnight. It would have been much cooler if bits were just added as you went instead of an overnight transformation. I will say that after the town upgrade the toilet gets put inside the gym itself which I was way too excited about. I love the fact that in this game like the last you can actually earn the info about how to get certain evolutions. Even later in the game as you recruit more Digimon you get the ability to actually choose what your Digimon will turn into if you have the right stats. But anyway before we head out of town for the first time the game recommends you get your boys evolved into rookies. And it's me we're talking about here, the overleveling grinderholic so I made them into champions before even heading out. And I was aiming for an Ogremon and a Nannymon because I like the evil and stupid Digimon but I ended up with these two. Which is a problem in this game because getting what you want before you can pick later on never seems to work. I don't know why but I think it's because more so than in the other games a lot of the requirements overlap. In the usual Digimon world tradition we have our first Digimon recruitment battle with the Mon that will be our item storage grunt. This time it's Patamon. With them defeated we can finally get a real look at the sprawling open world of this entry in the series. Sure a lot of the stuff is gated off to you by events in the story but you can pretty much go wherever you want. But you'll get murdered by high level Digimon if you do. And trust me this game will kick your ass more than any other game in the series if you aren't ready. The wild encounters in this game are savage. Have you any idea of what kind of noise happens when somebody's stabbed in the back? And I said because well, I do. I remember thinking this looked like a Unity asset flip and this game is actually running on the Unity engine. But I kind of like the look of it now with the context that it's a PS Vita game on a PS4. The environments more than any other of this series capture the feeling of that weird randomness that the first game gives you. With giant transistors and other random bits of computer bits sticking out of environments. You go through the usual deserts, fireplaces and undead places but they all have a certain charm to them and I never got bored of exploring. There is a few frame rate issues in certain areas which are annoying but it's bearable at the very least. And before I even get into the story I of course ran around these early areas recruiting every Digimon I could. Which is when you realise that most of the Digimon you can recruit fall into one of two categories. Either A they will want you to go on a fetch quest and get some items for them or B they will want to fight you. I was complaining that in the last game the recruitment methods were a bit simple but here it's very dry. 
I think it's kind of why I got put off this game in the first place. It makes it feel like an MMO or something. And another thing that compounds this feeling is the fact that in this game they've added in material collecting along with the items you would usually find in the Digimon World game. As you go around the world you will see highlighted points on the map that you can look for resources in once a day. You can get three different types of materials, metals, liquids and rocks which all get deposited into storage every time you go back to town. And later on in the game you get the builder who can use this stuff to upgrade the various buildings in town which makes me want to compulsively collect everything when I see it because I think I might need it later. Appealing to the hoarder deep inside my soul. Look at this thing right here, dude. Put this in a plastic bag and oh, boom, yeah. shower radio, buddy. Whoa. I think this stuff and the fact that there's a lot of cool things the Digimon you recruit can do overrides the fact that recruiting a lot of them is a bit samey. It's not to say that every way you recruit a Digimon is dull. For example, I love this one with my Otismon. Probably because I love my Otismon in general, but oh well. You find him in his pink mansion and he asks you to retrieve his favourite umbrella from another Digimon. Which I just find funny that this vampire wants his umbrella back. But fun, fluffy missions like this are few and far between in this game, sadly. However, it doesn't really bother me all that much. Another addictive thing they've added into this game is a proper levelling up system for our character. Sure in the past games there was a tamer level but they were pretty obtuse and levels would be quite spaced out. In this one you have a big tech tree of skills you can unlock using TP points that you get from levelling up. You can get stuff that makes your Digimon's lives longer or makes training more effective and it's another addictive system in this game. Some of the stuff is really useful if you know what you're doing and you can use some of this stuff to really break the game. The way you earn this stuff is actually genius. You can get XP for the tamer level by battling of course which is normal. But the most effective way to get SP is simple, by walking everywhere, every step equals XP for level ups. Every time you go back to home base you drop off all the materials you've collected and gain all your XP from walking. It just made me want to walk everywhere early on in the game so I could get more XP and get new skills. This really encourages you to walk about and explore because with every step you're getting something out of it, which further enhances that sort of MMO feeling this game was going for and I'm all about it, even though I hate people, and MMOs. The way they've implemented this just has me grinding the steps away for XP like a crack addled homeless man looking for a fix of his sweet sweet TP. I demand TP! I demand TP! More TP! Little dude's right, we do need more TP. And it certainly helps that in a lot of areas of this game they've got remixed versions of the tracks from the original game. That just hits me right in a nostalgia and gives this game that warm comfy feeling that I adore about this series. For me, this series of three Digimon World games that actually have the OG game style are like a warm blanket and a hot chocolate in the middle of a snowstorm. So even this early on in the game I was absolutely loving it and it got its hooks into me. After the game introduces you to all this new stuff it starts to introduce you to the cast of the game. Much like the last game in this series you have two companions, a boy and a girl that are helping you on your grand journey to save the digital world. You have Himari, the typical scantily clad sassy girl companion and Kyoto who looks like an anime version of Fred from Scooby Doo. They are pretty much the same archetypes as the two characters from the last game and they're entertaining enough I guess. A lot of the characters drop in and out of the story as it goes on like Lucha, a young girl that carries around a Numa One Plus which I'm jealous of because I want a Numa One Plus because he's such a good boy. Also Mirei from the last game appears to help the gang out which is a welcome addition to the squad. But my favourite addition is the inclusion of characters from the actual original Digimon world itself. It did sort of have me going, is that actually them? And yes it was, but I won't ruin the surprise for you because it gave me a little smile and it probably would give you a little smile if you played this. I'm in my happy place right now. Again, the story is nothing to write home about, but it had enough twists and turns to keep me interested. One of my favourite sections of the whole game story-wise, which was kind of half mandatory and half not, was the whole Aguino Wasteland saga. In this area of the game there's a war raging between the meat loving Chad Digimon and the soy infused veggie Digimon. There's also a war on the frame rate remaining consistent in this area too. Although when I played this game the first time this was actually the point where I gave up on the game because there's a mental amount of mandatory fetch quests here. But this time I knew what I was doing and the fetch quests weren't as much of a problem this time. This whole saga has you helping the leader of the Chad meat loving Digimon, the classic Digimon staple Leomon. This section has you recruiting Digimon from both sides of this conflict and my personal favourite frenemy Ogamon. It all culminates in you infiltrating the castle of the Veggie Forces leader Rosemon and defeating her. This whole part of the game just reminds me of something you might see in the anime and I wish there was more bits like it. A lot of the time after you finish a certain story section you'll have to recruit a certain number of Digimon back to the town. Which I like because it breaks up the action and gives a bit more adventure and grinding time. But god damn did this game kick my ass really hard towards the end half of the game. Even with a set of megas I was absolutely getting brutalised by a lot of the stuff that I was coming up against. And I was honestly having a lot of trouble getting megas in the first place because some of them had mental stat requirements. Because that's one thing that's really different in this game, the fact that the stats go way higher than they did in the past. In the last two games the stats would usually cap out at around 999 or 9999 for the HP and MP, but in this game the stats are 10 times higher. 
And I was wondering how the hell you get your stats that high in this game, and this was because I was applying my Boomer Digimon World knowledge into this game. I was doing training wrong the whole game and making things harder for myself unnecessarily. I was doing the usual strategy of sitting in the gym and training as much as I could, even using tamer skills that helped me get higher numbers at the gym, otherwise known as steroids. Even with these skills and upgrading the gym equipment, I still couldn't get the results I was after. My disappointment is immeasurable, and my day is ruined. Sure, the last game put more of an emphasis on the advanced action-based training, but you were still mostly in the gym. Here, the best way to train is to go out into the wilds and battle other Digimon because you can get way better stat gains from these than you would in the past. Which I kinda like because it makes it feel more like a traditional JRPG or something. It just makes me feel dumb because I was training the hard way throughout the whole bloody game. Basically, with the help of a skill you can learn from leveling up, you can make the stat gains you get from combat way higher than they would normally be. Then you just rinse and repeat until you get a buff Digimon because unlike gym training, battling barely wastes any time and you can get 4-5 to five times more stats for your buck. Obviously, it's not that simple. You of course still have to kind of know what you're doing and battle certain Digimon at certain points. You sort of have to farm the right level of Digimon till it's no longer effective anymore, then move on to somewhere else. Using this method, I got my two best boys, Metal Etamon and Venom Myotismon, that I wanted through the whole game. It was so satisfying going back to all the areas I was having trouble with and kicking their asses. But even with this method, the last few enemies in the game were still quite difficult and it doesn't de-challenge the game or anything. There's a lot to do in this game and it had me thoroughly entertained the whole time I was playing it. It really hit that balance between new stuff and giving out dollops of Digimon World 1 nostalgia, which is perfect for a goblin like me. It really feels like if you combine the original game with a JRPG and I think this might be my second favourite game in the series now. It definitely measures up to the original in many ways, but it has its own character about it. And that's not praise that I would give lightly. Because as I've already said in this video, the original Digimon World to this day is still one of my favourite games of all time. And I'm glad making this video finally led me to playing the PSP entry and re-evaluating this game. This game really is a great way to end this video because it caps off this troubled series on a really positive note. I haven't had such a good time with a game like this in a while and it was something I really needed. This series might have a bit of a patchy record but a lot of these games give me fuzzy nostalgia and memories of friends and family members that will stick with me forever. If you haven't played this entry of the series and you like the first game, you owe it to yourself to experience this game. <sighs> That's beautiful, man. Well, there we have it. I covered every game in the Digimon World series. I did not expect this video to get so long, but it's something I've wanted to cover for the longest time and I couldn't think of a better video to start my brand new channel with. I hope you enjoyed this for me very long video and let me know in the comments if you want to see me cover more Digimon stuff. I really want to do a video on the Digimon story series at some point, which I have very little experience with. And there definitely will be a video on Digimon Survive and the Digimon spin-off games in the not too distant future. But if you've made it this far, thank you for sitting through this mammoth video and please do like, subscribe and leave a comment to help a goblin out in the mean YouTube algorithm. Anyway, I've been a goblin and thank you for watching. If you would like to get all my videos months early and to get your name in the credits, consider supporting me on Patreon like all these awesome people have. Links in the description.